Can everybody hear me? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi, Tim. Hey, I see Sh Shalami and uh, Kaylee. Jack, welcome. I haven't heard from you in a while. Good to, good to see your text, <laughs> your chat text. Um, I'm sorry about the delay. I uh, YouTube decided they need to reauthorize me. Scared me for a minute. After after I got reauthorized, they said it takes 24 hours. <laughs> but they changed their mind within minutes. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> uh, technology. Can't live without it, right? <laughs> Sometimes it's uh, hard to live with it. Okay. Uh, does the sound, is the sound good? Okay. I see some questions. Um, let me start uh, how we're going to do this. I'm going to answer I'll stay on as long as I need to to answer your questions. Generally, I go to one o'clock, but if it goes past, I'll clean up. I'll answer the last questions before I close up. Put before you uh, ask a question, question before it. I can't see that good. And I'm looking at a little chat thing. If I don't see the word question, I'm very likely to just skip over it. Sometimes I can catch it, but it's a real iffy thing. And of course, I'm all by myself. So I'm trying to read the questions that were submitted and, and answer questions at the same time. So it really helps me out. Uh, even just a big C with a colon would work if you want to go fast. Uh, I know I type very slow, so that might make something. Um, I see some questions coming in, and I have pre-submitted questions, and I'm going to start there. By the way, uh, there are members of my Real Guitar Success membership uh, online today and who have asked questions. I always give them priority, uh, the questions I ask, answer in a, kind of an order, and then I'm going to answer whatever questions. But I will get to all the questions. Uh, at least right now, I can, I can still do it, um, even if I have to stay a little later. Um, I'm going to start with the written questions, but I'll mix in, especially if you have a question that's related to something I just answered. I'd like to kind of put that all together. So at the end, when I'm done answering questions, I'm going to do a drawing. These are for my members of Real Guitar Success. And we have this thing called a practice plan where there's 20 lessons in a month, uh, practice sessions. They just go through each session. Don't have to get perfect. Just go through it. Pick the ones they really like and spend more time on. But the idea is once they've completed those, they can put in a drawing once a month. I give away an Amazon gift card, 50 bucks. So let's get started. We've got a lot of questions and I want to get on with it. Let me start with the first question, which is um, I haven't heard for a while. What is MIDI and how does it apply to guitar recordings? This is from Shulami and she's online. So feel free to chime in if you think of anything you want to add to this. MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. When I was coming up, this was a big thing. All devices connected and communicated by MIDI. Not such a big thing anymore since all the USB and everything. Matter of fact, I haven't used MIDI in years, anything with MIDI. Uh, my keyboards does have MIDI capabilities, I don't use it. Um, I think some equipment still uses it. It's an in information um, format, so to speak, kind of like uh, some type of digital information format. And it's communicating, it's used to communicate between devices. So for example, uh, a, a keyboard that's MIDI compatible would connect via a MIDI cable to uh, another MIDI device, usually uh, a sound source, which has a MIDI in it. You play the keyboard, it sends, information through the cable to the MIDI device with the sound to say, play this sound, play this note. And then usually from there, it goes to an audio system and, and amplifies it and makes it, uh, or a recording system or both. So MIDI, not such a big thing anymore. I, I would, if you're really curious about it, I, I, would, I would suggest a web search. It's more of a historical thing right now. Now, I might be wrong in the studios, they might still have some use for it, but I haven't used it for years. Number two, I have both a nylon string and steel string guitar. Good choice. Um, when should I prefer one over the other? Are there specific, I'm still working on talking. Are there specific musical styles that are better on one of them rather than the other? Definitely. And um, I, I would, I couldn't imagine not having both. Um, nylon string, I use a lot of my fingers and the nails that I have, I use on the nylon string. And steel string, I can still finger pick, but I'm a little shy to, I don't want to break my nails, so I, I just will go easy on it. And I often use the pick for the, for the bass notes on the steel string. 
So there's no exact black and white, okay? There's a big crossover. Certainly for anything strumming and pop, pop rock. Steel strings. Steel strings louder, crisper, cuts through. And it's more importantly, it's what we're used to hearing in pop and rock country songs. Nylon string, you will hear some singer songwriters use it more in this kind of like folk style or uh, it's not common. And again, I, I think I've heard Joni Mitchell use nylon sometimes, finger picking style. Mostly though, I use nylon string for the styles of classical guitar and flamenco guitar. And also all that kind of uh, Latin jazz, bossa nova stuff is done on nylon string. In uh, Latin American countries, and if anybody's there from a Latin American country, you can tell me uh, if I, either I'm wrong or, or you can add to this. But my experience has been, I've traveled a lot through South America and Mexico, and they consider the nylon string the guitar, and a steel string is some kind of hybrid version of it. Uh, originally, I believe the guitars uh, were nylon coming from Europe, Spain in particular, and they, were, they had catgut strings, uh, which now we've replaced with uh, synthetic materials, nylon. So the steel string came after that. And then eventually somebody put pickup in the steel string and <laughs> hence the rock and roll was born. So think if you're using nylon string, basically I would say, does this fit the sound that I'm looking for? I, I don't want to categorize things. This has to be used for this and this has to be used for this. Some of the best stuff I like is where somebody nudged a little bit and kind of broke out of the way it usually is. And I wouldn't want to, uh, espouse that, that you have to stay here for nylon and here for a steel string. But listen, use your ears. If you're, if you're listening to music or you're playing something and, and you think it doesn't quite sound the tone of the guitar, try the steel string and see if that gets closer to what you're listening for. And you're, off, you're influenced by what you're hearing other people play, radio, records, what live people play. So we often kind of lean towards something, we're trying to imitate something that we've heard somewhere, even if it's not conscious. Mm. is the next question by Jaroslav. Uh, and if you're not online, Jaroslav, um, uh, of course, you can see this in the recording, but feel free to chime in if you are on the chat. Is there a way to practice away from my guitar uh, as when I'm traveling or not possible to practice to bring the guitar with me? Yes. So, what I do when I'm traveling, I'd be curious if other people have opinions about this. What I do when I'm traveling is I almost always bring my guitar. So that's, uh, even if I have to bring a kind of a beater guitar and, and just take for granted, I may not bring it back. But there is things that I'll do if I don't have my guitar. This is the chance where I might read up on some theory or read up some articles on practicing or come up with a, some something that I don't have to do my guitar and I don't want to take the time during my practice to stop and read. I'll often um, read up on some aspect of theory or some aspect of practicing, and then go back when when I have my guitar and practice it. That said, I don't. I'm not often without my guitar. And there are a few times in um, the year where I'll deliberately stay away from the guitar to get a fresh perspective. So, some of my best songs have been created that way. I, I I get them in my mind, and I'm anxious to get back when I, in the studio when can actually record something. Uh, I will take a tape recorder with me, by the way. This is more for people who like to write music or create music. I'll always take a, a recording device, not tape anymore, but I will hum into the recording device any melodies or rhythm sometimes that, um, that I want to remember when I get back to my guitar. Now, that said, there are little practice guitars. I've, I've seen online little guitars that are portable that you can take with you places. I've had several of them in my life. Um, some better than others. I don't know what's available right now, but a quick search on Amazon will show you uh, portable or travel guitars. I think they often call them travel guitars. Some are really small and some are just like regular guitars, but smaller. I even saw one recently that the neck comes off and can pack down to a little box like this. And then when you get to where you're going, you put the neck back on. It has some little device to solidify it, tune it up and you're ready to go. Um, that might be a good option if you're traveling a lot. Uh, I, generally speaking, I think it's better to have a guitar to practice with than to just try to make up things. And I also know of uh, several people, including Howard Roberts, famous jazz guitarist, 
who used to have a little piece of a fretboard he'd carry around with him and just uh, imagine the notes he's playing and practice them on the fretboard. He didn't hear anything, but he insists that was great practice. And I've tried that a little bit, but I can't say that I, I know enough about that to really say that's a great thing to do, but know that that's a possibility and you might wanna experiment with it. I do think there's science behind that sort of mentally practicing thing and having even a fake fretboard to kind of help with the um, sensation, I think is a good next step. I, I do, and this I would, I think it'll come more naturally as you get more experience. I do work out things in my head. I see myself playing the chords and the notes and then I'll go try them on my guitar. Uh, usually I don't do that separately, just sitting there without a guitar. I'll, I'll think that out because I can think more clearly and then I'll go try it on my guitar and I'll think it out again and try it. And that's something that comes more naturally as you get more experienced. So um, I hope I answer your question, Jaroslav. Feel free to, uh, if, if there's something part of that that I didn't answer. Next, I bought an electric guitar recently. Oh, oh cool. Uh, this is from Tim. And they sent me a packet of different picks. Ah, I get it. Uh, all the way from very thin to super thick, as thick as clay, he says. Um, and they don't bend. Since I struggle with strumming and strumming patterns, I would think that thinner picks would be better since they're flexible. I know Tim is on the earlier side of learning. Um, here's, here's what I want you to know about picks. Uh, for acoustic guitar, generally speaking, for general strumming and strumming and singing or strumming and playing songs while other people sing, you would use either a thin or medium pick in general. Now, I often tell students to start off with a thin because it's easier to get a smooth strum and the pick bends. The reason a thin pick isn't what you always want to use is the downside of a thin pick is if you try to play some melody or bass notes, it takes a while for the pick as it bends to snap back. It's, of course, just a very fraction of a second, but it's enough time to mess up any quick uh, slight or medium tempo bass lines or melody lines that you're playing. So I always use an acoustic guitar, a medium pick. That's sort of a balance between the two. I can still get a very you know, smooth strum. And I can play melodies. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, uh, some people do use a thick pick on the acoustic guitar. That's often because they're doing a lot of melody things and bass runs and things where they're going to play single notes and they want they want you know a quick uh, snapback when i play my nylon i do play a lot of melodies on the guitar and i use a very thick pick uh, it doesn't bend at all it's small and thick and i don't strum with it i use my fingers for strumming on a nylon this kind of flamenco -y style of strumming um as a beginner start with a thin get used to strumming the trick is i can strum just as smooth with a medium pick and it's because you get used to turning your hand just right. It's a very subtle motion. As you go down, it's slightly angled up. And as I come up, it's slightly angled the other way. So it doesn't dig into the strings. And that's a technique that it's, you know, you practice it over time, little by little, and you get better. And the other thing is, you know, I learned the right pressure, not digging in too much or, or not too far away that it doesn't make a good full strum. So there's technique involved there. And, um, many people use, many uh, guitar players use a medium pick and smooth just as strum as anybody can do with a thin pick. So we're going to do one more written question and I'll start looking at the questions that are coming in. Tim says, yes. I hope that means yes, I answered the question. <laughs> uh, oh, different Tim. There's a lot of Tims here. Next question. Mm, I have finished the beginner's journey. This is a, a series of six adventures in the Real Guitar Success. Each adventure kind of builds one on top of the other. And they're starting from very beginning all the way up to sixth adventure, which is full out strumming and playing all, most open chords and chord progressions and how to change smoothly from one to the other, along with the theory involved. So he's finished the first one of the six adventures. And he's wondering if should, he should run through it again or He's also started bar chords, I finished the beginning. Oh, I'm sorry, he's finished the entire beginner's journey. That's all six adventures. Um, and this is Joe Wong. What's a good practice plan for my level? I'm hesitant 
to get into weekly practice sessions without the necessary foundation. And the practice sessions are something, we, there's new ones every day, five days a week. And they're, they vary on different aspects of playing guitar and they level slightly too. They're nothing super advanced, but they're generally from on the beginner to advanced beginner side, maybe intermediate, depending on what you consider intermediate. So he's hesitant to get into the practice plan. Joe, I would say, um, do the practice plan and just decide for yourself which ones you like. Go through them very quickly, no more than 10 minutes. Decide if this is in your level and you want to you work on some more. Put, click it favorites if you like it and want to come back to it. That way you'll have it saved in your favorites list. Uh, if not, just move on. You can still check it off. Say, I, I tried that one and move on to the next one. You're going to find probably at least two or three, if not more, sessions that you say, ah, oh, this is just what I need right now. And you'll have them in your favorites. You can come back to them and practice them when you want. Um, if you've already done the bar chords, I'd say definitely start right away on the practice sessions. If you're just starting bar chords, a lot of students, and I'm fine with this, prefer to finish the bar chord course first and then do practice sessions. There are bar chords in the practice session, not every one, but you will come across them. And that will just be a matter of your confidence. A lot has to do with your level of, of uh, where you're at in terms of comfort level and, and going to some place unknown. Some people, something that's a little frustrating, they get very frustrated. And some people can bang away at the same thing and not get it for months and months and months. Generally speaking, if you've done and you really did the lessons up to at least 80% of, of proficiency in the beginner's journey, you can handle the practice sessions. And you just have to make a choice if one is either too far over your head or if you're just not interested. There's no right or wrong there. I'll keep presenting things to you. And that's how we kind of see which ones kind of click with you. And keep working on the bar chords. Definitely keep working forward. The bar chord course, bar chords for everyone is very step-by-step. -step, and it's a much easier way to learn bar chords than just jumping in and trying to play a bar chord in a practice session if you're not used to it. Now, let's go over to the chat and answer a few questions here. I'll start at the top, I think. I can't tell how far down it's gone. Let's see, oh, good thing. It has gone down quite a ways, okay. Let me see if I can start with the first question. Um, first question, I'm looking for a question, question. Sounds good, Tim Snyder, hi, hi Tom. Hey, welcome. Question, muting is very hard for me to solve. It's hard, got it. Uh, yes, um, muting is hard. I, I think if you want Alyssa, uh, ask me a little different way. There's, uh, muting is a technique we use with chords and melody. That's, that's a muting technique. Muting can also be you're playing a chord and the note doesn't sound. And the muting can also be, um, I'm playing a chord and a bunch of notes are ringing and I want to mute them. So I hate to just answer all of those questions if that's not that's certainly uh, appropriate for everybody. Um, so if you could ask me a little more detail, Alyssa, I'd be glad to answer it. In the meantime, I'm going to go on. Oops, not your problem, I have no sound. I <laughs> got it, good, so, I hope you fixed it, Jack. Question. Being a beginner, I am focusing on finger picking because chord changes are a bit tough. Although I still practice changes them a bit, it, it, is it a good practice? And this is, I don't know how to say this name, D-H-R-U-V, Druv? I, I don't, I've never come across that name and I, I have no clue on how to pronounce it. So forgive me. Uh, I really, and I like to say people's name correctly and I'll be embarrassed if I, if I start calling you something weird that's not your name. So um, finger picking, see, the thing is, finger picking still relies on changing chords. So if changing chords are hard for you, adding finger picking is not going to make it easier. When you're finger picking, you're going to have to change from one chord to another. So I would encourage you at least practice three chords that are in a key, like in the key of G, G, C, and D. Those are three common chords in that key and you can play lots of songs. And then practice basic finger picking with those. If you can't change chords and you're practicing finger picking, now you're starting to add complexity to complexity. And finger picking 
in the long run, it's going to get much more complex than just changing cores in, in terms of the amount of time it takes to do it smoothly. So I would at least practice a few cores first before you get spend too much time on finger picking. Uh, you're just multiplying the amount of trouble you're going to have later on. Next. Hi, Kaylee. Question. This is from Madeo. Hope I said that right. M-A-D-E-O. Madeo. Madeo. Can you talk about neck and back pain from playing guitar? Oh, yes. I could spend the whole hour talking about neck and back pain. Um, Madeo, this is something that uh, I dealt with a lot. And I suspect it came, there was a time in my life where I was playing sometimes eight hours a day for days on end. I was doing this promotion thing and made a lot of money and uh, made a lot of fans, sold a lot of CDs basically. But I was playing for eight hours at a time, sometimes longer. And I didn't realize, but I was doing a lot of this. I was getting tired. So I was, you know, kind of leaning down. And um, unfortunately that caught up to me. And after a while, I, my back, pain got so bad, I could barely sit down and play. Now, over the years, I found things to help. And I can say today, I can sit down for a fair amount of time and practice. I figured out a practice routine to avoid this from happening. I take breaks every half hour, roughly. And I can talk more about that. I have a whole system. I set a timer even, uh, 25 minute breaks. I use something called the Pomodoro system. And it really works for me. I wish I'd known this 30 years ago. And I can put a link to that if you're interested. But let me go back a little bit. The main issue is watch your posture when you're practicing your guitar. And try not to sit down for more than an hour at a time. Just take breaks is what I mean. If you're going to practice for three hours, take breaks every 45 minutes, that kind of thing. Or do like me, every 25 minutes. That works for me. I just take a short break, stretch, clear out my mind, get my blood circling, and sit down and practice some more. Or go on to the next task that I'm working on. It really works. Don't let yourself keep doing this. Now you have to look sometimes, it's okay. But don't stay there. Look and move back, look and move back. This for periods of time is, is gonna get you. And watch other things, you know. I know you're probably much younger than me. And my dad used to tell me this all the time and I never paid attention. Watch when you're just doing regular stuff like picking up stuff and all. We all know we're supposed to use our legs and not just lean over and use all our back muscles. We all know that. Didn't affect me when I was younger. When I was older, I wish I'd paid more attention. I'll just chime in. I'm, I'm not thinking everybody's going to listen to me and all of a sudden change their ways because I didn't. But maybe if you hear it enough times, uh, it, it will help. If nothing else, when you start having back pain, my words might come back to you or, or your father or mother's words. Um, in terms of dealing with back pain, I've found many things to help me. Yoga is a, a real big one. And I singled in on exercises that I do every day. And um, a good yoga teacher, I just ask them, what, what's good for back pain? And they tell me there's this part and there's this part. If you stretch this part, it helps relieve this part. So yoga is it's a true, it's a tried and true science that has worked for people for thousands of years. So take advantage of it. And it's really uh, available now with YouTube videos and the courses, yoga classes everywhere. The other thing is um, I used to get regular massages. Not anymore. <laughs> uh, we're in uh, lockdown. So it's been months, but that helped me. And I just like it. <laughs> um, I found something called a foot massage, which is really a whole body massage in a chair. And I just felt, you know, for hours after, I would just feel my body would feel light and easy. And little by little over several days, it always came back. It didn't solve it. The other thing is I went to a chiropractor. I think it helped when it's the severe times. I didn't find it a lasting help, um, but a lot of people swear by it. So I wouldn't knock it. And um, I really, every day I use an incline bench. This is, uh, matter of fact, I'll put a link to a post that I made, which shows the incline bench and some other tips on dealing with back pain, this will be a good thing because I have pictures. Incline bench, you, you lay on it and you go upside down. I do that every day and it stretches your spine just a little bit, releases the pressure on the spinal cord and it really helps. And I also hang from a bar every day too uh, and do some push-ups and a few other things. I mean, pull-ups, but the hanging from the bar is sort of like the incline bench. It's sort of the, just coming at the other way. So um, stretching and uh, incline 
I definitely recommend it for everybody. Same as stretching your fingers when you're playing guitar, even just for a minute or two a day when you practice. Um, I think I'll stop there and I'll put a link to the blog post, which has more details and pictures, which I think will make more sense than me trying to explain certain exercises and things. And I think I put some links to even some exercises. So hope that helps. Good question. <laughs> Uh, you asked the right person. This is something I've spent a lot of time thinking and dealing with. I paid a lot of money, by the way, too. I went to a therapist, paid thousands of dollars, and I'd say only marginal helpful and, and also chiropractors and, and read lots of materials. So you're getting sort of the synthesis of what I've learned over the years. And one more online here uh, on the chat. Let's see what we got. I'm looking for question, question, question. Uh, question, question, question. Let's see, question. Um, so I'm going to go back and see if I can read a little more. I don't want to take too much time here. For acoustic finger style and for classical finger style, which one's better? Thumb picks or fingers? Okay. And I won't even try to say your name. <laughs> it's a really long name, and I, I couldn't do it justice. So I think you, you know who you are. For uh, acoustic finger style and classical finger style, there is no better. Uh, some people prefer thumb picks, some people not. I prefer my fingers, though I have lately taken to using the thumb pick on acoustic guitar for the bass notes, not finger picks. I, I just, I've tried finger picks several times. I don't like them. Um, I really, I get a certain sound with by feeling the strings. And I don't know, maybe I could get used to finger picks, but it's not likely gonna happen for me. But if, if you try them and you like them, there's nothing wrong with that. There's not better or worse. Uh, the thumb pick, I can get a little louder bass note. And I, I like that. I can especially dig in, especially when I'm, see how the bass note on a steel string just, it's not very loud. But on a, a nylon string guitar, I don't need a thumb pick. I can dig in my thumbnail a little bit and get a louder bass note or softer, depending on what I want. Mm, thumb pick on steel string, not on nylon. Finger picks, not for me, um, but might be for you. I would ex I encourage you to experiment. There's, you can't go wrong. They're cheap enough, especially the thumb pick. Just get a few thumb picks. Get one that fits good and snug. I started off with a loose one and kept twirling around. I realized um, that I needed to try something else, not just give up on it. And I was glad I did. Uh, a nice a thumb pick that stayed on my thumb nice and firm. I could get the hang of that pretty quickly, and I liked it. Uh, I've tried strumming with a thumb pick. Some people do that. Didn't doesn't work for me. I, again, I wouldn't knock it. I've heard people use it, especially in blues. Sound good. Okay, let's go back to pre-submitted questions. Um, great questions, guys. Oh boy, we've got a good audience and uh, some great pre-submitted questions. Pat, Pat, this is a good one. Do you have any suggestions for learning to put the accent on strum on beats two and four? Uh, like on a down, up, down, down, up, down, up. Let me see what that's gonna sound like. Accent. Down, up, down. I can't quite figure that out. I think that's what she's saying. One, two, and three, and four. One, two. So that's the, feet, uh, the accent on one and three. It's a subtle push on one, two, three, and four. One, four, one, two, four, one, two. Now I'm going to try accent on two and four. One, two. Yeah, it gives it a different feel, huh? It gives it a little uh, a push in a different way. Um, so yeah, both could be useful. Bam, bam. The drummer does that sometimes in this drum beat. Boom, bam, bam. That's two. One, two, three, four. I would say if you want to practice and get better at it, um, she's in the sixth adventure, which is about strumming. So you know, that's about the right place to start thinking about those things. I would simplify your strum as simple as possible. So I think what you wrote, you're trying to do something just a little different than a straight down up strum. I would start with just simply down, down, up, down, down, and keep everything very simple on the strumming side of things. Even, I'm, no, I'm gonna take that back. Simpler, down, 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 down. And get used to counting one, two, three, four, and exaggerate at first. One, Get used to that feel of exa 
exaggerating the two and the four. Then try adding uh, uh, some little fancier strums. One, two, and three, four. One, two, three, four. Maybe try a bass note. One, two, three. No, bass note doesn't work because it naturally puts an accent on the bass note. Do a strum. Two, three, four. And try to back it up a little bit so it doesn't sound so exaggerated. This doesn't sound right. One, two, three, four. But it's a good way to learn and get the feel of it. What you're going for is where it gets to be natural and it is kind of a feel. I can feel, mm, da, mm, ah. I don't have to count and say, oh, accent here, accent here. That's because I've done it a lot. And that's what will happen to you as you exaggerate it. You'll get used to that and then you can back it off and just make a little. Bobby McGee, that seems like a natural for that one. Uh, be the emphasis, the accent on two and four. So it's an ongoing adventure. Uh, there's no exact right or wrong. You keep working it and, and find what you like and try to do enough times where it gets to be natural and then add to that. So you're doing great, sixth adventure. Um, next, can you demonstrate how to change strings on different guitars so it will go smoothly? Sometimes I struggle with it and the ties don't look so nice. Uh, yes, uh, welcome to the club, changing strings. I've st <laughs> I still don't look forward to changing strings and I can do it pretty quick. First of all, she's, when she says tie, she must be talking nylon string because, oh man, what did I do? Ah, well, that wasn't my nylon. <laughs> this is a much more expensive guitar. Look what I did to my, uh, my $8,000 guitar, right? <laughs> Something, it was like that mousetrap thing where one thing hits another, it's another, you ever play that game, mousetrap? When I was a kid, I loved that game. But something, I hit something down here, I hit something on the cabinet, it tipped over on the cabinet, fell off and onto my guitar. <laughs> what a good gal. Fortunately, it didn't affect the sound, but uh, it's a pretty visible neck, huh? Anyway, I digress. Um, she's talking about this, tying on the strings here. Really, it just takes practice. Look. Uh, look at uh, YouTube videos. Uh, I'm not going to demonstrate how to do that. Take all my strings off or, and you know, that wouldn't be a, the way to do this live. But I did make some videos and I'll put a link to that on tying it. But it's not going to come up really great the first time or second time, probably the fifth, sixth time. It'll start looking pretty good. Unless you're more exceptionally talented. You probably could do it faster than me. I'm, I'm kind of slow that on things like this because it's tedious for me. I, I tend to not like tedious stuff. But they do it, and I do it well now. The other thing is, I bought a string winder that's electric. It only cost me like, I think, 15, under 20 bucks, and it saved me a lot of If you're doing it without a string winder, you're really wasting your time. At least get a mechanical string winder. It's much faster than doing it by hand, but the electric one makes it easier in them. Because it, it's, I can go faster, I'm less likely to leave old strings on my guitar. I'm more encouraged to change the strings. Um, what else could I tell you? I will put a link to a video on changing nylon strings. I have some videos too on changing steel strings. Maybe if I see that, I'll add that though. I, I realize that's not what you're asking. So that's the best. I go through in much more detail on the video. So you'll like that. Uh, it's a skill like anything else. And one more. Um, if you were advising a new student on buying a new guitar, what advice would you give him or her? This is Shulami again. And when you're first buying a guitar, first of all, make sure you get one that works right. There's nothing more frustrating than spending your time and energy on something that no matter how well you play, it won't sound good. And you're more likely to get frustrated and have wasted a bunch of time. Now, for me, that's more expensive than a few extra bucks getting a decent guitar. Watch out for guitars that are used from flea markets and stuff. It seems like often there's something just inherently wrong with them that you'll have to deal with for years and years. I bought guitar and a piano that way and was sorry both times. I had to sell it and lose money because it just was never gonna sound right. Um, I think in general, it's good to buy from a store where you can touch and see the guitar and talk to somebody. All stores aren't created equal, so it depends on what you have available. And of course, right now it's harder than usual with the pandemic thing going on, but um, maybe, uh, later on, um, 
you can go to a store and ask somebody, but you have to use your own judgment too. Don't just default to somebody else's judgment because especially in a store, there are salespeople. And for the most part, there are different levels of expertise and information that they can give you, but they're always, they're always gonna be looking out for their own interests as well. I would say plan on spending, if it's a new guitar, I'd say a couple hundred bucks. Yeah, you can get away for a hundred bucks. It, it might be okay. I'd spend a little more. I'd spend at least 150, maybe 200 bucks on a beginner guitar. If you can, if you've got money and can swing a $300 guitar and it's worth $300, do it. You, you're going to have more time and your time's worth something. If you're enjoying your time and you stick with it, it's worth the extra hundred bucks. It's going to save you uh, that in terms of effort and stress many times over. Uh, don't buy a thousand dollar guitar if you're just starting out. You're not going to appreciate what makes a three hundred dollar guitar different than a thousand dollar guitar. I know that from experience. I didn't. I could hear a, a two thousand dollar guitar, and I couldn't tell it was better than my hundred dollar guitar. Yeah, I did start with a feeder. <laughs> I started with a guitar. I think it's worth more like fifty bucks, and it never quite played right. Funny thing is, I didn't want to give it up. I was so used to it, I was attached to it, and somebody gave me a better guitar, and I didn't want it. Um, fortunately, my dad encouraged me. He was very nice about it. And, and after playing it for a little while, I couldn't go back. But it was kind of funny. I wanted to stick with my old Peter. Mm, also, decide on the stiff string or nylon for your first guitar. And it kind of depends on the music that you want to play. If you really want to play pop rock, something that's normally played on a steel string, you might just want to bite the bullet, get a steel string. It's going to hurt your fingers more than a nylon. But going to give you feedback. In other words, the sound is going to sound like something that you like, and that's going to encourage you and keep you going. You can put, by the way, on a steel string, lighter grip strings, or even something called silk and steel to make it easier on your fingers. So if you really want to play the music that's played on steel string, get a steel string, maybe put silk and steel strings on the guitar or have somebody in the store do it. And then when you've been playing for a little while and your fingers are getting tougher, put regular steel strings on the guitar. If you like classical, flamenco, uh, folk styles, Latin styles that are played with a nylon string, go for a nylon string. Now the downside there is the neck's a little wider, but I, I find people are amazingly adaptable. They often, at first, because something's difficult, assume that something's wrong and if they just got the right guitar, but it's, you'd be surprised that it's just a little persistence how you can get used to things. I'm not saying if you have really teeny childlike fingers that you get the widest neck. No, get a smaller guitar. There are three quarter guitars, we call them, that have little thinner necks and smaller bodies. So be wise about it. But don't just assume because it's a little awkward when you, when you touch it that it's never going to work. That, that's not how it is. Good. Let's go on. Um, let me check over here and see if we've got any new questions online. Uh, and again, I'm looking for questions. Can you talk about, I talked about neck and back pain. I saw that. Uh, answer the next, uh, answer the next question or I'm gonna call the cops. Uh, okay, I don't think that's gonna work. <laughs> um, uh, let me go. Um, <laughs> okay, good. Um, the person that spelled T-H-R-U-V says he's going to put more chord changes in his practice routine. Good. And again, stick, try to get good at changing between like three chords. Don't just try and do 10 chords and practice a little on each chord. Get good at three chords and being able to change from one to the other and then add to that little by little as you can and, and keep up the changing. The bridge of my guitar got loose. I tried putting it together, but I didn't fix it. How often does th that happen? And how can I prevent it from happening again? Well, um, and this is Sam, Sam Wake. The, honestly, that's never happened to me. The bridge of my guitar doesn't come loose. Oh, I see the whole bridge he's talking about. Um, this part. Uh, no, that's not supposed to happen ever. Um, that means your guitar is, is not made well or it's just, you know, anything can be faulty. Um, don't glue it yourself. Um, I hate to be adamant about that. Maybe you're uh, more <laughs> technically minded than me and can use things like wood glue and you know the right glue for a guitar, but I wouldn't try it. I would take it to a repairman and ask for their opinion. Is this worth fixing or should I just buy a, a better guitar? That's their opinion. And you know, you have to get somebody that you can trust their opinion, but it's not that hard. 
if you want to play guitar, you have to deal with the instrument a little bit. And if you don't want to deal with it, just go to the store and get a better guitar that the bridge is not going to fall off. That doesn't happen usually with a, a well-made guitar. That's a tough one. Yeah, you cannot play if the bridge falls off. And if I glued it, I, I know this, when they do glue a bridge on the guitar, they use some clamping devices and put pressure uh, because there is pressure on, the strings is making pressure on the bridge. And you can't just use regular wiggle, slap it on there, let it dry and then put strings on. There's too much pressure to do that. Mm -hmm. They have to do a clamping thing and special glue. I don't know, you know where you get that glue, but I know it's not as simple as just Elmer's glue and glue it on. Um, yoga, yes, I'm 52 and want, uh, to get back to playing the last year, 39 years of not playing. I love it. Heather, <laughs> yoga. Another thumbs up for yoga. Um, question, I see this. Question, Dave How? Hey, Dave, welcome. Good to have you on. When I sit down to practice, I sneeze. Could be a religious action to my guitar. That's a new one. Hmm. Um, <laughs> I, I couldn't say. Um, I, I wonder sometimes. Um, I love the smell. I especially a, a handmade guitar. I this one I've had it for years and it still has a smell. I love it. I smell. It. It's real wood. I love it. Doesn't make me sneeze, fortunately, but could be. Uh, it, I would think it would be a subtle uh, allergy. Nothing that's that I would be concerned about. It, I wonder sometimes, uh, my wife, every time she goes to bed, starts coughing, and I think it might be a little bit of a kind of a program. So her mind is associated, lay down and start coughing. And she always gets over it very quickly. It's not a problem, but I notice it's, it, it, it happens all the time. I wonder if that could be an issue too. Whenever you sit down and play guitar, you sneezed a few times and it kind of got to be a habit. Just a thought. Interesting. Um, Medeo says, thanks, great answers. I'm glad I could help. Uh, I'm very happy to help uh, even a little bit if I can of people uh, to avoid some of the problems I've, I've had with back pain. It's, it's, it cost me money too, because I, I couldn't play for a while, gigs that were three hours long because of that. I'm working on Beginner's Journey, fourth adventure, Go Daisy. Just as you said, the F chord is difficult for beginners. Moved on, but still practice it each day. Good. And that's a great thing to bring up, Daisy. First of all, I introduced the F chord in the fourth adventure because I don't want to wait too long. And the fourth adventure seems like a little early, but I'm thinking you could start practicing it and just keep coming back at a little at a time. Don't get stressed over it. Like I've had a few people say, oh, do I have to stay here until I get that F chord? And well, no, don't do that. Because... When you finish the sixth adventure, you're going to want to go on to bar chords for everyone. And I'll come back at the F chord in a whole, I'll break it down to little bitty pieces. So just take it lightly. Excuse me. We're going to come back to it. We're going to come back to the F chord and we're going to, we're going to nail it as well as all bar chords, step by step. So don't worry about it. Glad you brought that up, Daisy, and that's for everybody. Uh, let me go back to the written questions now. We've got quite a few more here. And some good ones I saw on here. Ah, this Tim is talking about having tendonized with bar chords. You suggested sure to practice along with stretching. And that I would recommend for everybody that's uh, anywhere near my age, go short and stretch a little bit each between each session. And this is my favorite. Uh, there's many exercises I have, but this is the one that my go-to if I only have a, a minute to stretch. I'll do this for the count of like 30. And then I'll, I'll do this five times. See, I'm stretching the wrist, but mostly it's the fingers. This is where I've, ha I've had problems. And seems like it's working because I haven't had uh, soreness in the fingers that prevent me from playing for years now since I've been doing that regularly. Mm, I'm talking a minute, 60 seconds total, right? That's not, not gonna be a time issue. A friend who plays guitar suggested I could reduce the amount of pressure required on the strings to make them ring out clearly with my left hand by pulling the guitar towards me with my right shoulder while strumming to make the guitar press against my left hand. So I know what he's talking about. That's this. And it's particularly uh, an issue with bar chords. I'll make a bar, right? And I think I'm gonna not make the rest of the bar just so you can see very clearly. 
Now, what I'm doing when I make this bar chord is I pull the guitar neck into my body a little bit, and on my right arm, I'm holding it back. So what's happening is, you know, I can feel this guitar a little more pressure against the chest. It's not dramatic. It's a slight pull. But I'm also using my shoulders to help make the bar instead of just clamping with my thumb and finger. I've got double duty. I'm clamping, but part of the pressure is coming from the pull that I'm doing. Yes, do that. And I teach this in bar chords for everyone. If you haven't gotten there, you will. It's in somewhere around the third uh, chapter or something, third or fourth chapter. But this is a very useful technique. And again, it's not exaggerated. You're not yanking. It's just a subtle pull and it's helping with the squeeze of your fingers. And also I'm not pulling so much that I have to, you know, having a hard time strumming. You, you don't want to make it difficult to move your arm. It is I'm, with the crux of my arm so that it's not affecting the, the motion of my right arm. Good question. I'm glad you brought that up. And again, I will come at it in the bar chords for everyone. So, but it's the kind of thing like anything else it becomes a habit. You don't, you want to get to where you don't have to think about doing that. So try it now and try it again when you come to it in the lessons. Any good suggestions for backing tracks for songs from pop rock artists like Cat Stevens, James Taylor, Oh, yes, you're talking my language. <laughs> These are the artists I was brought up with. Um, I have never used backing tracks that were pre-made backing tracks. I make all my own backing tracks. And it's time consuming, but I like it. I'm a composer, and that's creative for me. I don't usually make backing tracks for famous songs, for popular songs. I make up backing tracks for, to, to, for students to practice specific techniques. I find you get more mileage that way than like playing through a whole song. But at the same time, I, I understand the reason for it. It's fun. And if you practice more, even if it's not working on a specific thing, the more you play, the better you get. So I, I certainly think there's a value there. I don't know because of that exactly where to find these great backing tracks. I have done a quick web search and I found a link to one place called Frets on Fire. Uh, no, I'm sorry, um, karaoke slash dash version.com forward slash guitar backing track. I'll put a link so it'll be in the blog post when it goes up in a, in a couple of days. Um, I also found another article which I thought was very interesting. It has to do with how to try to remove parts of a song using Audacity, which is a free software. And I think everybody should have that software. It's free and I use it a lot. It, it, it works on a, a laptop or your desktop computer. I don't know if they have versions for um, iPads or anything, but I'll put a link to that too. It shows how to use Audacity to like remove the vocals or remove other parts of guitar. And it's not a black and white thing. You, some songs you can remove the vocals more easily, some harder and some not at all. But once you know the techniques, it's, it, it's easier to try. And I think you could, zero in on other parts, not just the vocals as well. I read the article and it does suggest different ways of removing different parts of different instruments, in other words. Um, they were talking about removing everything but the guitar so you could really hear the guitar part. I will put a link to Audacity also just for, you, you can find it with a quick web search, but I'll put a link to that too in the notes. Next question. I have a song that I want to play the verses finger style and the chorus strumming. How do you make the transition from one style to another, from strumming to finger style and back and forth so it's not too abrupt? Um, I won't pretend I have a lot of experience with that. I generally uh, either strum or finger style pick a song. I would say in general, though, when you're making a transition from something in a song, either tempo or uh, volume or um, uh, in this case, from finger style to strumming, that there's not one quick fix, but you want to put something that indicates there's a change coming. So what I would do, let's say I'm, I'm doing something like, now I'm going to go to the finger pick. I'm going to leave a little space there, and then that indicates something's changed. And then I'll go to the finger pick again. So in this case, I use space to indicate a change. You would want to experiment. If you're making up a song, you want to experiment and see what sounds right for that song, for the style, and for your own ears. 
And one more question submitted, uh, pre-submitted, we'll call this. I learned a couple of Travis picking patterns, but they're in 4-4 time. I was wondering if there was a Travis picking in 3-4 or 6-8 timings. Um, wow, I never thought of that, but because I got this ahead of time, I looked it up. And then generally, I would say this. Uh, if you're talking authentic Travis picking, it's in 4-4. That's part of the nature of Travis picking. But you can do similar picking in 3-4 and 6-8. And I found a website where somebody's kind of experimenting and showing you kind of how you can kind of push that into 3-4 and 6-8. And I'll put a link to that. I, I thought that was kind of clever. So in, instead of trying to give a whole lesson on that, which is not something I've actually ever done, I'll put a link to the lessons I found. And I think you'll find that very helpful. Um, those notes will be, usually I get them up within 48 hours. I have some other people are helping. It kind of depends on their schedule. So you'll find a link in those notes. Now, let me go back over to the chat and see if we got some more questions in the meantime. Anybody else? Question, question, question. And if I miss your question, um, maybe you could re-ask it. Uh, if you didn't put question, re-ask it with question. I'm looking towards the end here and I'll see it quickly then. Question. Yamaha C40 or Cordoba C1M for a beginner guitar. Um, and that's Medeo. Medeo, I don't know because I don't know the Cordoba C1M. Uh, but I would say in that price range, I know the C40, that's kind of a standard beginner classical type guitar. I would say in that price range, Yamaha and Fender are, for the money, good bang for the buck. Not mean Not to say there's not other great guitars in that price range, but I know Yamaha in particular, I can always count on getting a good value and a standard quality. Um, I don't know Cordoba. I have friends who, uh, uh, a friend who plays a Cordoba, a more expensive one, and he really likes it. He endorses them actually. Um, but it is a, you know, the guitar he's playing is thousands of dollars. So I would say it's not likely you're going to go too far wrong either way. In that price range, as long as it's a recognizable brand, it's probably not going to be a piece of a junk. Just get it from a source that if there is something wrong with it, you have some recourse. Mm, and next question. Ah, Heather says, for Dave, maybe the guitar is dusty and you have a dust allergy. I never thought of that, but that makes sense. I sneeze at the littlest hint of dust, and I don't know how much of that is actual allergy and how much it's just I'm programmed to sneeze. And Tim says, thanks. Uh, the part about barcodes was helpful. And somebody asked, why is a 1.75 nut so common acoustics, but are rare on electrics? So he's talking about how wide the nut is on the guitar. Um, I don't really know the history of that. I'm sure this uh, a guitar repair or a guitar maker could really geek out on that. But I would guess that the electric guitar neck is just, people are used to a little thinner neck. And so the nut is actually thinner to accommodate the neck. On a nylon string guitar, it's gonna be a little thicker. I don't know off the top of my head the different measurements of nuts. Generally speaking, when it comes to repairing a guitar, I do take my guitars to a repairman, but I always ask questions. I wanna know what's going on and what to look for and those kinds of things. So I know some things from that from talking to repairmen, but in general, I, I'm not an expert on repairing or all the different parts of the guitar. I tend to focus on what's gonna help me be a better player directly and let the repairmen do their thing. I do not change things though. Sales Skywalker, I like that name. Cool. I have, uh, a Moore guitar amp? Maybe I'm not reading it right. M-O-O-E-R. I've never heard of that. And it has a Bluetooth ability. Can I connect to my PC and record the sound of my amp? I don't know that, um, Sales Skywalker. <laughs> I don't know if that's a made-up name or if that's really your name. It's cool. Um, I, I don't know that amp. And I would suggest that should be a, simply a part of the operations manual. What I often do nowadays when I buy a new piece of equipment is I'll go on uh, YouTube and see if somebody's made a video that can save me some time and just show me quickly how to get up and running and what's important to know. Uh, it's worked for me nine out of 10 times these days. Um, 
is there a, a nut width you prefer when shopping for a guitar? And uh, this is um, related to the question about the guitar nut. Um, no, I, I don't even think about that. I basically, um, I buy guitars from people that I trust that usually have a reputation. <clears throat> uh, several of my guitars are handmade, so um, I, I wouldn't, they, 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 even one of the guitars, if I were to buy it from him, he'd have to wait until he could make a new guitar for me. Uh, generally speaking, I, I do go by the feel. And if a guitar man started asking me questions about that, a guitar repair man, I would defer to their wisdom based on the effect of either a wide or a thinner neck. But I don't know um, to ask for a specific width of neck or, or that I even have a, a certain preference. Now, that said, I'm going from a nylon string to a steel string, which have a very different width. And I would suggest that unless there's a reason you're sticking with one guitar all the time and you're, you know, you're practicing in a way that you have to be very good on that particular guitar at a certain style, that you're probably going to be flexible in terms of getting used to one neck and the other. I remember with keyboards, I used to have people who would say, should I play piano or electric keyboard? Well, the people that are, I work with can do both one to the other easily, go back and forth. They just got used to it. That. So I don't know that a little difference in the width of a neck is going to make a difference. Somebody who's been practicing and playing for a long time. You just get used to one or the other. Maybe some people have specific preferences I don't know about. Interesting. Okay, so that's all the questions I can see. If I missed your question, uh, I'm not going to go back to the top and start uh, looking for them. If I missed your question, I'm sorry. But if you want to ask right quick, I'll come back and finish up any last questions after I do the drawing. So we're going to give away an Amazon gift card. And again, I've um, printed out all the names of the people that have completed the practice plan for the month of June 2020. And I'm going to pull a name out without looking. We got one. Let's see. Paul, congratulations, Paul. You are going to get a $50 Amazon gift card. And the way I think of the the drawing, it's just kind of a little extra incentive. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll make a game with myself and I'll say, I'll, I'll practice this for 30 days. When I do, I'll treat myself to an ice cream. I don't eat ice cream very often. <laughs> and that little extra motivation kind of gives me a little energy. And that's what I, I kind of tried to build into the system, a, a little perk if you do the practice plans. I want to get people through the 20 practice plans in the month. But the real reward is the practicing and what you're learning and how you feel about yourself and, and, and the joy in playing guitar and getting better. So I hope you take it with a grain of salt. I don't mean it to be a seri too serious of a, a game. That said, any last minute questions? Way to go, Paul. <laughs> now Tim says, way to go, Paul. I don't see any more questions. So I think we've answered all we can for today. Thank you so much for joining me. This has been a pleasure. I look forward to our next session, the first Tuesday of every month. I might have to go to Thursday next month also, depending on what's going on with this, uh, all the uh, pandemic stuff and everything. But I'll let you know. I'll, it'll either be the first Tuesday or the first Thursday of the month, uh, 12 noon California time, that specific time. And of course, you can always find your time based on that. Take care for now, and I'll see you again soon. Bye.